and I'm sure everybody enjoyed the bhajan. So moving on, uh, as we know that uh, Mahatma Gandhi's teaching were not limited to about independence and civil right, but uh, he was visionary about environment also, and he predicted uh, at that time also that if uh, business as usual has continued, probably will face some environmental problem. Um, and also the, the you know world is facing the, the biggest challenge of uh, food and nutrition security as well as uh, maintaining environment. And in this direction, it is doing a lot of work. And to give some perspective what it is doing, now I invite Dr. Sudhir Yada, uh, our research team leader on environmental sustainability, to deliver a seminar on feeding the world while protecting the planet. Dr. Yada, please. Um, good morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to be here to talk on this uh, great occasion. Um, they, 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 they are on, on June 5th, uh, while we were talking here about World Environment Day, at the same time we also we were also told that Indian Embassy has been, you know, uh, agreed to do this celebration together. So it's a it's a great pleasure for us, and we are thankful for that one. And when, uh, when we were discussing about uh, the, the World Environment Day, uh, so we thought uh, when, when we will get this opportunity to, to discuss with you some of the thoughts, what could be the, the topic? And uh, the topic which is top of our mind is, of course, first is feeding this world, but then how, why feeding the world, how, wh what, what we can do for the planet? So that's, that's where we thought that uh, probably we can share some thoughts and kind of leave you with that message and, and, um, and working together in that direction. Tamina already talked about uh, this great quote of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, from my perspective, I see positivity uh, to, to start with, uh, with this quote that uh, when Mahatma Gandhi said that this earth has enough resources for our need. So there's a lot of positivity in that one. So it's not about like we are at the end of the earth. There is, a, there is sufficient resources. But there's a word of caution here, that we need to careful what is need and what is greed. And that's where I think there's a, there's a great lesson which, which, uh, which can be taken. And the first of the, one of the big challenge which, which is in front of us is this fast growing world. The, the world is growing so fast, much faster than a solution which we can think of, uh, to, to feed the world. So that's a big, big challenge in front of us. So to address the challenge, this agriculture revolution started, um, you know, with the with the first phase of what they call extensification. So what what the what farmers were doing at that time were basically cutting the trees, burning the forest, and doing agriculture there, and then shifting somewhere else. So th that was the first phase in terms of agriculture revolution, where basically um, the, the, uh, the forest started to replace with the agricultural land. And if you look at, in terms of the expansion, uh, in 1600, it was around 1 billion hectare agricultural land, and we are about 5 billion hectare by now. Um, so we are keep expanding the agricultural area. And most of these, this area is under cereal crops. Uh, so that's where, again, the perspective of food, that uh, as we were clearing the land, uh, we were growing food crops, mainly cereals. But the question comes, how far we can go with ex this expansion? Or whether we are reached to the peak of agricultural land expansion? Looking at the data, different scenarios, some of the scenarios is saying that we are almost there in terms of reaching that threshold of expanding land. We don't have much uh, further to, to expand uh, the land to, to grow food for, for, uh, for feeding this growing world. And with that thought, we reached to the second phase of agriculture revolution, which was intensification. And intensification is basically growing more per
per unit area. So with the same piece of land, you, you grow more food because uh, uh, we don't have now much privilege to expand the land, so we are focusing on growing more food per unit area. And this started, as we all know, around green revolution with three, three major things, major activities. First one was talking about high yielding short duration variety. So that was kind of a big boost uh, to the world when, when we were able to um, do uh, this research and finding these, these varieties which, which can produce much more than uh, what the traditional varieties were, were producing. But then it, it also added with a lot of fertilizer inputs uh, for producing more. At the same time, there was a significant investment on irrigation. These three steps, or these three um, uh, initiatives, lead to increasing the production uh, of food in the world. So while we talk about agriculture revolution, uh, basically the center of talk so often is rice. And we talk about uh, uh, that, whether it's about World Environment Day or uh, World Food Security Day, we talk about rice. And the question is, why we talk about rice? Why rice? And if you look at, at the facts, that uh, what, what uh, Tamina was saying, that rice is not a crop. Rice is a life. Rice is a culture. It feeds 4 billion people in the world. 56% of the world population is uh, dependent on rice. It covers 10% of the total crop land in the, in the world. So it, it has a significant uh, uh, contribution or, or, or part in the, in the land use. It's also grown by 144 million families, which is 25% of world families. So one fourth of world families is dependent on rice and it's also uh, basically contribute to 40% of the world's poor. Along with that, it, in terms of economy, it has the uh, 206 billion uh, annual value uh, to the world's crop. And that takes us to the point why, why rice is center of talk when we talk about whether feeding the world or protecting the uh, planet. So that's, that's what we, we would like to discuss further. The third phase, we talk about extensification, we talk about intensification, and then uh, basically the consequences um, with, the, with this agricultural evolution. Um, definitely the, the research which was done, the progress which was done in terms of extensification and intensification helped us to feed the world. So the hunger uh, in the world has been decreased significantly. And this was done basically by three major cereal crops, uh, maize, wheat, and rice, which basically produce about 60% of world food energy intake. So these three crops really help in terms of um, handling the undernourishment of, of the world's population. But while um, while we were focusing on feeding the world, we get biased towards the food. Looking at the ecosystem service wheel, which, which is basically important to keep this balance, uh, uh, you know, in terms of sustainability, we did a lot of efforts which indeed were important towards food. And, and uh, that imbalance this ecosystem service wheel, which basically not only uh, look at the provisioning um, of food, but it also plays a lot of role in, in regulating, sporting, and the cultural aspect. Again, it's the, the whole system level thinking rather than looking at one component of food. And when we get, the, when we get biased to our food, we felt these uh, consequences. There are big news, concerning news, the wetlands in the world are declining at a very sharp rate. What does that mean in terms of sustainability of food system? Uh, recently in Times, there was news that uh, UN report that one million species could go extinct. 
again the question arises what it mean for the sustainability of the food which we are producing and i was bit touched about this news the nice time that a baby born today the climate and their future and that's kind of a feeling of the the, the the climate change uh, last night i was uh, watching uh, uh, news of trump uh, interview in uk and one thing which touched me that um, he had i think he uh, he, he talked with prince charlie and and uh, the, the news anchor was asking how was the meeting and there was debate about what what he feel about climate change but one common agreement that he said prince charlie talked about future generation that can we hand over a safe uh, planet to future generation and trump said i agree with that so that was the, the point is doesn't matter what you call it we need to protect the planet that's that that the key and talking about uh, climate change uh, global warming as we know is is uh, at top of our head our researcher the development partner the investor the country are talking about it so uh, global warming basically what happened that when we receive the sunlight some of this is absorbed by uh, by earth by different gases and and that warm the earth and some of these gases which contribute in absorbing this uh, uh, heat are called uh, greenhouse gases or in other way greenhouse gas effect which which result in heating of earth surface there has been debate whether uh, the warming is taking place or not data is saying yes there is a significant increase in in the temperature in fact the news which are coming from my country is that in some of the some of the state the temperature already hit 50 degree uh, 50.4 yesterday in one of the one of the district so it's turning like a oven you know so this is really a concern that the temperature is increasing and um when we talk about greenhouse gases uh, there are two uh, major gases uh, one is methane another is nitrous oxide which contribute a lot to this greenhouse gas effect so global warming and if you look at both methane emission as well as nitrous oxide emission agriculture sector play a major role in terms of emission of these gases um, and that's where again we need to look at um, how we do our agriculture practices versus uh, protecting the the environment so again talking about methane talking about nitrous oxide all of a sudden the rice is again center of the talk that um, uh, rice play a important role in global warming and if you look at the facts um, the, the the data which is available that rice consume um, or how it is said that rice consume 50% of world's total fertilizer it takes 35% of world um, fresh water used in agriculture and also it, it contribute 1.5% of greenhouse gas emission uh, as a single throw 1.5 is a lot but then i as a researcher i i i strongly argue with the point of facts versus perception and some of the example um you might have read many times uh, that rice consume uh, 2500 to 5000 liter of water to produce 1 kilo of grain so that's a common kind of news which i i hear that's a perception the fact is farmers apply 2500 to 5000 liter of water to produce 1 kg of water these are two very different things and that's the that's where the opportunity lies that it's not the plant requirement it's the practice the second thing is uh, there is a lot of news that you know rice uh, contribute a lot towards methane emission again it's a perception the fact is the methane is emitted by a bacteria which which only survive under flooded condition so if you flood the rice it will emit if you will not flood the rice it will not emit or, or it will be reduced so the point which i want to make here is the problems are associated with production practices and that's where sometimes we don't look at the root cause of the problem we look at what we can kind of see um, uh, so we have to really look at the what what 
is causing the problem and coming together to solve that one. And that's where Tamina was mentioning some of the innovation which it is doing. Our focus is on these root calls, that how we can help farmers to change their practices. And so do we have a solution to reduce um, environmental footprint when we come talk about rice? Um, yes, we do have. Amina mentioned about some technology. We have a bundle of technologies uh, which are good to reduce these environmental footprint. But the important point which, which we need to be um, very careful that all these technology has trade-off. And we need to understand those trade-offs. It's not about that, hey, here's the problem and we there's an adequate solution. This is nature of, uh, this is the, what we call the, 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 the basic uh, uh, nature of, in, in, in that if, if you are gaining somewhere, you are losing somewhere. And we need to understand that spin off uh, with different technologies. The other topic which I would like to touch, and, and this is kind of again to a quite hot topic, is air pollution. Um, and we are getting different news um, from, from India, uh, from, from Delhi, from, from, from Beijing, uh, that the, the air quality is deteriorating very fast. And it, interestingly, it's not about what, what things are happening in that particular, uh, particular state or particular province. Uh, I, was, I was in uh, South Korea uh, in Seoul uh, last week, and I, I saw this smoke, and I was a bit surprised. It was nice weather. I said, how come there's a smoke? And they said, it's coming from China. And same thing is in Delhi. It's not like the smoke is from Delhi. It's also coming from nearby state. The point is the natural resource is for everybody. It's not about what you are doing. We need to do collective action. Otherwise, if somebody will not join that collective action because of their practice, we may also be affected. So it's a, again, point of coming together. And uh, this, uh, again, I found this uh, very interesting uh, you know, this news line that Delhi smoke uh, foul air came from India's farming revolution. So that, that the last part is very interesting, the farmer, uh, farming revolution, and again linking back to the point of intensification and rice stroke. So what is happening that because of intensification, the turning around period between two crop is very small. And from, from what farmers only do that, they, they use one match stick and that's all. So we need to look at, from practice perspective, that what, how we can empower uh, farmers that they can still go with that small turnaround period and grow more food while we can avoid this uh, burning of rice straw. This is the, the NASA image from the North India, from, from uh, one of the state Punjab. All these red points are indicating where the burning is happening. Uh, so it's a quite concern, uh, concerning uh, area which we are, we, again, we need to do collective action. So what can be done if you don't burn the straw? What are the options? And Asia product produce about 300 metric tons of, of uh, straw. It's a huge uh, amount of straw. And if we look from positivity, this is a big, big asset which we, which we have with us and it can be used. There are different options. Um, uh, India is progressing very well. We use it as a mulch, uh, again, uh, protecting the, the, uh, the water um, and also uh, protecting the, or uh, building the soil health. It can be incorporated. It can be removed. Uh, uh, the balers, uh, a lot of work is going on using the balers. And I get more, more excited about this alternative use of a straw and it is uh, quite active in that area to, to find out what, what can be done. Um, we can use it as a compost, we can use it as a feed for livestock. There is a, some upstream work now it is doing in terms of using it for biofuel. Uh, that's an, another energy uh, kind of uh, green energy uh, uh, which, which we can use. And more interestingly, uh, for different biodegradable products, so there are packaging material, uh, packaging boards with, with rice straw. There are utensils, uh, you know, party utensils with rice straw. There are ports uh, with rice straw. And it's all about thinking out of the box rather than leaving that burning is the only option. There are many uh, other options which can be uh, which can be explored in terms of uh, sustainable use of um, of this again um, what we call that it's a it's a golden asset uh, if you want to use it. Um, but it's all about 
about uh, from our perspective, we, we focus a lot on understanding the trade-off, whatever options you offer, as I said, there's a spin-off. And so looking at when you burn, when you remove, but whether partially or fully or complete, there's a trade-off. Uh, you may reduce the toxicity of um, air, but you may add greenhouse gas. So how we can reduce the overall trade-off? So we need to look at that spin-off and pick uh, that options where the trade-off is minimal. Um, I would like to touch a bit about uh, when we are talking about consequences, uh, talking a bit about solution called problems. In my opinion, um, well, you know, they did a great job coming up with sustainable development goal. It's, it's a big, big move, uh, which is well appreciated. However, um, what happened that while we explored, we come up with excellent sustainable development goal, there has been major focus towards two SDG, which is basically zero hunger and no poverty. Indeed, these are very important, very important. But again, that balancing the ecosystem wheel, we, we missed that trick. So we are looking these sustainable development goal in silos that I have seen different agencies, they are saying we are working on this goal, this goal, and that goal. And from my perspective, that's where the problem starts. That's where the trade-off starts. That focus on too much on one side, you leave a lot of um, uh, negative impact on the other side. How we can come together? Um, again, it cannot be done by one institute, one agency, so need collective action. That we move, we take this uh, sustaining the ecosystem as the backbone, as the driving factor for feeding the world. And uh, this, basically, instead of picking one or two, we need to link it with the ecosystem service wheel. And if we use the sustainable development goal towards strengthening the ecosystem, that will take us to, to a point where we can feed the world and we can protect the, the planet. And that's what the United Nations has declared that the next decade will be, I mean, the focus will be on ecosystem, uh, restoring the ecosystem. And I think we need, all need to, to support that move. We all need to think um, from that perspective. So I would like to, I mean, this, is, this was an attempt to share the broad overview um, about, um, about our direction toward producing uh, food and protecting the world. And I would like to finish my talk with, again, this great quote by Mahatma Gandhi that, be the change you want to see in the world. Don't ask other, uh, you know, to do it. Be part of it. And if we will be part of it, and I'm sure that we can address, we can, what Mahatma Gandhi said, that we have sufficient resources to feed ourselves, but also protecting the world. Thank you, the art. Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, some time for some question, if anybody has. For Dakiana, or any comments, any perspective you want to add on this? So the floor is open. Thanks, Sudhir. Every time I listen to a talk of yours, I learn many new things. Life is a big discovery. Sudhir, I wonder if it, it, you could home in a little bit on, on India and um, issues around diversification of crops and how that fits into your overall vision of feeding the world and conserving the planet. Um, and, and I would like to revert back, John, um, he always, um, he is one of the person who has, who look climate change from a very different perspective very big picture, right? and again, looking at technology. And I can see that it's, it's very, very important, going back to the point of we don't look at technology perspective, looking at the bigger picture. So if, when it comes to the crop diversification, it's all about at country level, we need to think what are the best places to grow food um, in terms of, again, quantity, but also the environmental footprint. And there's a lot of initiative going, going on now in the country that how we make the, 
the Eastern India and the food bowl of the country. Um, so uh, we, we know that the, the rice has, uh, again, the practice how they grow rice in, in North um, India has a large footprint. So how we will shift it, that needs, again, I, I believe, collective actions in terms of how different organizations come together, um, A, uh, in terms of research, uh, with, with the good options, but also the policy environment that how the country come forward with those kind of strong um, decisions that uh, if we had to do it, we had to do it. Otherwise, uh, we will keep talking about environmental footprint, uh, food security, and we will continue with the same pace. So that's a very, very important topic uh, in the dimension of um, the protecting the, the environment. Thanks, John. Uh, this is a very, very good question and again, a very common question. And I'd like to cite an example of iodine, um, that when there was a big deficiency of iodine, uh, there were a lot of talk going on how we will make it sure that iodine leads to people. And they looked at different medium and they finally landed, landed on salt. And the point was because salt is consumed by everybody. And that's where when there's a talk about nutrition, there's a lot of discussion going on changing the diet, which is definitely one of the options. But then how to reach uh, this about 7 billion people? So one common kind of uh, uh, agreement is, why don't we use a medium which is already reaching to 4 billion people, which is rice. So I think we have an opportunity to increase the nutritional value of rice. rice I, I would like to you know, strongly say rice is not a part of the problem. The part of the problem is how you look at the rice. So there are practices which can be changed. Um, with, with, with our partners, we are working to improve uh, the, the iron content in the rice, the gene content in the rice, the, the overall uh, grain quality of the rice. And if, if uh, for some of the aspects like zinc or so, we already have increased you know, double the amount which, which, which it, it used to be. So think about it that as soon as you will get success, you already reach to 4 billion people. There cannot be more strong channel to reach that number of people. But at the same time, I mean, it's not the only. I mean, still don't forget we have other, uh, you know, 50% population. Where it comes the crop diversification. So most of Asia and Africa, it's a rice-based system because of agro-environment. So uh, one, once I was talking with a farmer and I asked, hey, can you grow something other than rice? And he said, yes, I can grow water lily because the only water lily will survive in rainy season. So the agro environment, uh, you know, give us that opportunity that we look solution around rice. We, so I think that's where we, we used to, for four billion is we see kind of low hanging fruits about increasing the nutritional value of rice, but with rice based system, crop diversification, probably we can also touch the other part. More question? Sudhi, thank you for an excellent talk. Once again, uh, I learned a lot uh, from your perspective. My question to you is, uh, I mean, it is obvious to a lot of us that adding organic carbon content to the soil is one of the key ways of uh, achieving nitrogen use efficiency. I mean, IR8 uh, actually performed very well because it is has the capacity to use nitrogen very efficiently and in a very effective manner. 
So how can breeders, from a breeder's perspective, keep on focusing on this use? Uh, I mean, we seem to have uh, been adding more and more nitrogen, which is making uh, soil into cement. But how do we focus on adding more c carbon into the soil? And also, breeders also, how do you see yourselves giving the message to the breeders to improve uh, the nitrogen use efficiency as a character in the variety itself? Um, thanks, Obha. This is again an excellent question, uh, a bit more research focused. I, I used to present one slide, which is one of my favorite about nitrogen use efficiency. And I think uh, sometime, now speaking as a researcher, we use these, uh, uh, these parameter um, kind of for the benefit of our own publication or so. Um, for example, high nitrogen use efficiency doesn't mean that it's a good indicator. Um, we have faced problem of soil mining. While on low nitrogen use efficiency, we have faced problem of water pollution, like in what is happening eutrophication in China. And that's where we need to see that balance. That it's not about uh, that's the message which probably I'll give to breeder. It's not about targeting that your target is improving the nitrogen use, use efficiency to a to certain level. We need to look at from uptake perspective that uh, that how much uptake plant is taking and using it in terms of translocation to, to, the, to the grain. So reducing the uptake uh, from, the, from the soil and uh, having the more efficiency to converting into the grain, that's the part. It's not only improving the, in the path we have a lot of focus on like less uptake or more uptake from the soil. So now I think we need to look at the plant process that how within the plant uh, things happen that uh, we, we get more grain uh, without mining or washing of nutrient uh, to the water bodies. So that's on nitrogen side. Oh, for, um, for soil health side, I think that's an interesting discussion going back to the rice straw management. And that's something where we need to uh, look at in terms of um, decomposition of straw where reader can really, really help. Um, Use of straw, where again breeder can really really help the silicon content in the straw, where breeder can help. So we need to really look at the whole value chain that where we want to use the straw, and I think that message can go to breeder in terms of improving the plant rate that that straw can be used um, for 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 the soil health perspective. So broadly in that direction. We can still take a couple of more questions. Congratulations, Dr. Yadav. That was a very, very informative uh, lecture that you gave. Um, uh, just a comment first that uh, we'll all have uh, vegetarian food for lunch today, in keeping with the theme of uh, being environmentally sustainable and uh, to help uh, uh, ameliorate climate change. Um, you mentioned briefly about the uh, activities that Kiwi is focusing on on alternate uses of uh, straw. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Sure. Um, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, a whole wing uh, which is focusing on uh, on the use of straw. So uh, basically what we are looking at is when we inc incorporate straw, uh, there is a lot of greenhouse gas emission. Um, so we, we thought, let's look at if we collect it so first thing, it is working on uh, these balers, like what are the different ways to collect. There's a lot of cost involved, so how we will re reduce that cost? That's number one. Second area where we are looking at is when the straw is collected, how to improve the value of the quality of feed for live straw. So as it is, the, the, the quality of rice straw is, is not so good. So how we can further improve the water, uh, the quality of the, uh, the, the straw so that it can be used for livestock. So there's a lot of work going on, which in fact is a very, very important uh, topic. Um, areas like Eastern uh, India, uh, Odisha, Bihar, where there's a large fallow in the dry season. So you have rice followed by fallow. And livestock, we have seen um, that uh, in some of the area, livestock were grazing and they, they, they basically injured their, their nose because it's a salty soil and they don't have anything to eat. So how we can improve again the feed value? But then there's a lot of focus going on other use. Uh, there's a 
all attempt going toward the mushroom industries that how rice flow can be used. But more recently, we are working on the biofuels that uh, how we can use to convert it in, in, in the biofuel. Um, we also have uh, you know some research going on what I presented about the alternate products. But the major focus is uh, animal feed, improving the quality of animal feed, biofuel, composting. Uh, so these three are the major where it is thinking that this large amount of straw, about 300 metric ton in Asia, can be used for that purpose. Uh, just to add on what Sudhir has mentioned, it's about straw management. Uh, one of the important technologies we showed about the happy cedar machine. For that, you don't need to burn the residue, you keep the residue in the fields. That's in situ residue management or straw management. So instead of even taking out because the time window is very, very less. That's why the challenge is even collecting straw, waiting to the mailer and everything takes time. And transporting that huge amount of straw to other uses takes time. So one of the uh, you know potential is to use that machines in situ straw management and planting the next crop in, in the full rice straw. In that way, we're addressing the issue of uh, you know, burning as well as we're addressing the issue of soil health, which is also a concern in particular in Punjab, Haryana. So if we maintain the straw in the field, it will decompose and add on uh, carbon. And, and that comes to the point of uh, understanding the agro-environment. Uh, so in Punjab, Haryana, uh, northern part of India, where we have only one rice crop, the second season is kind of dry season, and they grow wheat. Uh, in that scenario, it's much, much better to keep straw on the soil surface. While talking about Southeast Asia, where there are two rice, so then there is a trade-off with the greenhouse gas emission. So if you keep that straw and then you basically add water that increase the, as I said, the bacteria which, which em uh, result in emission of greenhouse gases. So that's where we are looking at uh, kind of the, the, uh, the cafeteria of options and picking it depending on where it fits very well, rather than saying this is the one which will like one size fit all. So, can I take one more question? As uh, dear, another challenge that we have in agriculture is you know uh, our farmers are getting older. There's people, young people, are no longer interested in agriculture. So. What do you think we can do to engage the youth uh, in agriculture? Um, thanks, June. Uh, that's that's a very uh, good question, and I think uh, agriculture used to seen as kind of business of with dirt. It's no longer that kind of business, and that's where the direction where we need to move. We need to look uh, from a perspective of youth. See it as a, as, a, as a business like other sectors. And there, are, there has been a lot of development where basically different uh, agencies are involved, <coughs> including ERI. Um, looking at the modern technologies, uh, looking at kind of uh, you know, all high throughput technology, which can come to agriculture and change the face of uh, the way it is done now. So, uh, Rinder just mentioned about heavy theater. So before you were thinking how to handle that straw, now we have machines, we have bailers, uh, we have talking about advanced technology, there is a lot of development going on using drones for agriculture. Your half of the work can be done by drones for, for, the, for the community. And I think that's the direction where we need to do, we need to go that uh, instead of thinking about uh, a business with dirt, this is a business for food, business for planet and, and that's the message which we need to give to youth and, and not only the message but also the, the options to do it efficiently. Final question. It's not a question, it's really a comment. I, I, I love seeing threads in talks and having done a lot of Indian history at university, it's interesting, we're here celebrating the 150th anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi and you were talking about iodine salt and it reminded me of course yeah. that one of the earliest non-violent protests by Mahatma Gandhi yeah. was the salt march yeah. so it's yeah. very nice to see all these connections from <laughs> you this morning comment not question
morning, and thank you for your very informative talk. Uh, my question is, I'm Chris Paleva from the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. Thank you for the invitation here. Um, because we are also celebrating World Environment Day, um, my question relates to what you said about how collective effort is very important and how all these moving parts would have to come together uh, towards concerted action. Um, I'd like to ask how much biodiversity is being taken into account when um, innovations are being developed, when trade-offs are being considered, um, because we can't move one uh, toward and try to um, discuss climate change, for example, without taking into consideration biodiversity, and there is an important connection between biodiversity and agriculture. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for the question, but also bringing this dimension of biodiversity. Um, talking broadly, uh, not about it broadly, uh, this is a concerning area. And you have seen that uh, the news which is coming about one million species which will be extinct. It's really concerning. And the, the, the bitter reality is that we are not taking biodiversity seriously. That's, that's, that, that's the really, really a challenging question which we need to, A, first thing we need to accept it, that we are not taking it very seriously, and then we need to take actions. I wish you would be here. Yesterday we had a talk, and that was focused on biodiversity. And um, in, 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 at ERI, uh, basically we have this research program on environmental sustainability. And we have different domains. It has five domains, climate, water, energy, soil health, and biodiversity. And it's very, very interesting uh, that uh, rice fields are called as human-made wetlands. And we are looking at the, the biodiversity in, 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 in this human-made wetland, and it's amazing. But then our concern is that as we are moving towards intensification, what that means to that biodiversity? And that was like yesterday talk, but going back to your point that I think it's an essential part of ecosystem service we cannot take risk to, to, to ignore it, it's, it's must. And I think we need to again be collective, collective action that how we think about human, their food, but also about other species. Thank you. All right, let's thanks Dr. Yadav for his inspiring seminar. Thank you. <laughs> all right, before moving to the next uh, program, may I request uh, all the guests from embassy, as well as, uh, Peter Brothers, the Chief of Staff, 